Now the radio, if you look at the back, last page or second last page of the manual that came with it, has a pretty complicated schematic. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's very nonlinear. So what I'm going to do is pull out sections and kind of analyze them, perhaps with linear loads to see kind of what the section's doing. So we can start to talk about an approximation as to what the behavior is. First example is the AM detector and the automatic gain control circuit. I'm actually going to start on the far end of the block diagram, page two. And kind of working our way back from the audio amplifier is the AM detector and the automatic gain control circuit. I've also measured some of the transformers that we're going to use in lab, and just going to kind of treat them as ideal right now, as being lossless. Then we can see, perhaps with a further simulation, or really just the actual lab data as to what's going to happen. What I did here on, on the left-hand side of this transformer, it's actually a 3.3 to 1 ratio, so it's a stepping down in, in voltage, but also some kind of impedance level changes. I took the equation and set up a series of three voltage sources to mimic the effect of that equation. So what I've got here is V sub CM, the sum of the frequencies, this is a cosine function where V sub CM is V sub C A over 2. This is a combination of equation 1 and equation 3. And then the next sine wave is V sub CM, which is again the same term but with a differencing of the frequencies, and then the 90 degree phase shift will give me the cosine function. And then the last one here is the term V sub C at a frequency of f of c. And for the example that we're about to look at, we're going to use a v sub c of 1, a modulation index of 0.8, a carrier frequency of 455, and a modulating frequency of 1 kilohertz. So we need something in the audio band. I don't even recognize this or not, but here what we're going to have coming out of here is, is some well, amplitude modulated signal, but no, a sine wave type function. We've got a diode and a capacitor. This is a negative peak detector that we talked about in ECE 302 and 303. You can find this on your 302 CD on page 59. So what's going to show up here is the peak of what's here, the negative peak, plus a diode drop. But this is going to be changing pretty fast with our audio signal, and this is not a very large capacitor, so it's going to kind of track the negative peaks of our waveform. Take a look at this shortly on the next page. And what this section over here is probably doing is that uh, we've got a very large capacitor here, and so it's going to let the, the DC level from here be passed over here and attenuate the AC part of the signal. Take a look at what's going on on the next page. I did this in steady state. There is quite a bit of a transient response that's going by. But, but for V sub C of 1, you can use the formulas on page 1 to actually calculate this maximum and actually the minimum. Uh, and the value in here based on the modulation index. So you can see that amplitude modulated waveform, the very high frequency one here appears as a blob. You may want to run these files just to kind of see how things are going and you can play with some of the numbers and watch what's going on. Now this is the voltage that's coming out of the negative peak detector and you can see that it is the bottom portion of the waveform. It's a peak here plus a diode drop. And the diode drops around it's going to be varying a little bit because the current that's going through it is changing. In this particular case over here, it's about 0.59 volts for the diode drop, and for this case here, it's about 0.635. So we're getting this bottom portion of the waveform being stripped off with our negative peak detector. The large capacitor is not letting much of the AC show up. If you blow this up, there is a, there is a small AC waveform here. So what you've got is an average value here that's about 1.39 volts. If you made V sub C equal to zero, rise up to 1.47. Now part of that's coming from the 9 volt battery on the previous page. And the fact that if you had no input signal here, you have just a short back to ground. So you have a loop here with a kind of a voltage divider and then a, dop, a diode drop. So that would give you a, a voltage here from just simulation of about 1.47. Then as the signal is coming, we're getting a neg negative average value to this. In this case, it's, it's positive because we're adding this diode drop to it. But the value starts to drop. And again, there's a lot of nonlinearities and a lot of things going on, but we're seeing this number starts to drop as an amplitude shows up. In fact, if I run it again, increase this amplitude, the value drops again. So what we're getting is, as the sound is getting louder, we're getting a smaller and smaller voltage at node 34. And that's sent to the automatic gain control circuit to vary the gain of the first uh, IF amplifier to, to keep the sound fairly constant in the speaker. We're going to play with, around with this a little bit and listen to its effects as we do the experimental part of building the radio.
A couple things interesting to note here is that the top of this waveform, oh, here too, we've got the, the negative, the peak here, and then plus a diode drop. In this case, the diode drop's around 0.62, and here it's about 0.752. Just taking the difference of these two numbers and figuring out what the diode drop is. But you're getting that, again, that waveform that was here. This is a sine wave. Speech would be a combination of all of these things. The upper part here is really bounded by the diode itself. So it's stripping this off, but also holding the top of the waveform at about a diode drop. Okay, so kind of a qualitative explanation as to how that circuit works. As you notice in the picture of the radio, perhaps you had seen some of these as you were building the audio amplifier, there were what appear to be little tin cans, and what's inside there is a transformer and a capacitor, and also a little set screw on top we call a tuning slug. It allows you to vary the effective value of the inductance in our circuit. And so we'll be able to tune these inductors by turning that cell set screw. I want to analyze what this transformer is doing to try to explain what we'll be seeing in some of the simulations. So what I'm going to do is go to page 94 in our chapter 1 notes, and we talked about reflecting an impedance uh, load back to the input. Now let's ignore this center tap for right now. Let's assume that a load R sub L is put here, and so what shows up reflected through is the, what's ever hooked up on this side, which is in this case a physical C0, and then the transformers L1 and L2, and we'll take coupling between L3 and, the, and both inductors, we're getting, not ignoring center tap. And so we're going to get the ratio of L1 plus L2 over L3. And again, this is the derivation of this is on page 94 of our chapter 1 class notes. Now, is it possible to express this as an equivalent of two series capacitances and two series resistances in parallel with the two inductances L1 and L2? This would be a representation of what this is doing. We could do that if we set up the following relationship. Suppose that there is a voltage across this proposed equivalent circuit. We call it V. Then there's a voltage divider here with SC2 and SC1, or to say 1 over that for the impedance. The S's actually drop out, and we get a capacitive voltage divider of 1 over C2 divided by 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. Now, if you multiply by C1, C2, you wind up getting C1 over C1 plus C2. We call this a capacitive voltage divider. It's actually the other capacitor. If you want to solve for this voltage, it's the other capacitor over the sum of the two. You might have seen something like that in EC201 or 202. The voltage across L2 would be uh, just the impedance of the inductor over the sum of the two impedances. And again, the S drops out, and we get an inductive voltage divider, but it goes like a resistive divider. It's the element you're interested in, the voltage across over the sum of the two. And lastly, again, the voltage V across these combinations, all in parallel, would be a voltage here would be R2 over R1 plus R2. Now, like the oscilloscope probe idea, if we were to make these three voltage dividers equal to each other, and we could say something about the relationships between these elements, but we could also then put a short circuit between these three elements without changing the effect. So again, here's the actual circuit. I'm creating a model under certain conditions that will let me put a short circuit in here, and then we can kind of see what that effect is going to have on our use of the transformer in the circuits. We're setting these three voltage dividers equal to, to each other, and then we divide by the numerator term. So I wind up getting a 1 and then a ratio of L's and C's. If I want to make these equal to each other, then this would have to equal this. So I could solve for then C2 in terms of L1, L2, and C1. Now the capacitance C0, go back and look here, is the series combination of my modeled C1 and C2. So C0 is the series combination, which would be uh, 1 over 1 over the capacitances. So that means that 1 over C0 would equal 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. But I know that C2 is C1 times L1 over L2. So flipping that over, I then get 1 over C1, pull that out, and I have 1 plus L2 over L1. So now I could cross multiply and solve for C1 in terms of C0. So this is my original coils, L1 and L2 and the capacitance that's in this IF transformer. And I can express it in terms of my model C1. Now, because of this relationship, I can solve for C2 by taking the value for C1, which is right here, and then multiplying it by L1 over L2. 
That's going to give me a 1 here and then an L1 over L2. So they go in opposite directions with L1 and L2. I'll do the same thing for setting the resistor ratio equal to the inductor ratio. We would have then that R1 is equal to R2 times L1 over L2. And then the sum of R1 plus R2 would have to equal the reflected in impedance, in our case R sub L with the inductor ratio of L1 plus L2 over L3. And I can use this relationship here for R1 as R2 L1 over L2. So I can solve for R2 now by taking this and dividing by this plus 1, which would be L1 plus L2 over L2. And of course this is going to cancel with this, and I get R sub L times L2 divided by L3. Then I can go back and use the relationship for R1, which was R2 times L1 over L2, and substituting this last result in right here, um, I get the cancellation of the L2s, and I get that R1 is RL, which is a, the load on the secondary side of the transformer, times L1 over L3. So I could take this representation of the transformer, reflecting the load, and represent it as an equivalent impedance between a center tap here, where I put a short circuit in, because I've made these relationships balance each other. Now what's interesting is that this is going to resonate at 1 over the square root of the capacitance times the inductance, and so will this do the same thing. The term right here, C0 times 1 plus L2 over L1, if you multiply through by L1, gives me an L1 plus L2. And if I do that also over here, you wind up getting an L2 plus an L1. So these two resonate at the same frequencies. And when they resonate, they become an open circuit. And all we see is the remaining reflected resistance times the inductance ratios. And we can measure these inductances between the different terminals with just an LCR meter. The next case we're going to take a look at is called the second IF amplifier. I pull out this section out of the radio. This going to approximate the connection here, which is the AM detector. This is represented as a resistive load. It's actually a nonlinear load, but we can kind of see what this section is doing in a sense in an approximation to get a handle on what's controlling things. And also, what is this transformer doing? If we could use that equivalent circuit we just developed on page 11. As we saw in 302, amplifiers have an AC and a DC component, and so let's see if we could do the DC analysis. Here you could think of the inductor as a short circuit, and you could assume that most of the current going in the base is pretty small compared to currents that are flowing, say, in this voltage divider. So for DC, this cap is an open circuit, and so we'd have a voltage divider of 10K with 39K if nothing was hooked up here. And that would give us a voltage of 1.836. And that would still be valid, provided that this current was pretty small. So let's just make that assumption that the betas are high enough of the transistor that most of the biasing current in these two resistors just goes straight back to ground. And then likewise, too, if this is an AC source, this is actually an equivalent circuit for the transformer that's feeding this from the next stage. We have a fairly low resistance here, and so we could pretty much ignore the drops with a small current and a small resistance, so that this node voltage here would be roughly about 0.7 below this node voltage, which is roughly this 1.836. That would give us about 1.137. Again, this is an approximation. Then I could figure out the current that's flowing in this resistor, which would be the DC emitter current, and that would be about 2.42 milliamps. Now, if the beta is high, the collector current and the emitter current are about the same. So I know a rough value for the collector current of transistor 9. Then we could use that to figure out the AC parameters of the transistor. And at low frequencies, we just have a GM and an R pi as an equivalent circuit. Okay, I sub C is about 2.42 milliamps. If we assume that eta F is around 1, and that V sub T is around 26 millivolts at room temperature, then we'd have about 93 millimoles. If the AC beta of the transistor is around 150, then with this value of GM, we'd have about a 1.61K value for R pi. 